But I'm glad to be with you this evening, and um, man, your awakening, I mean, that is just precious, isn't it? Um, singing that song, I remember the first time I heard it, I thought, you're awakening like God is not awakening. He's already awake. You can't wake God any more than he already is. And then the last line comes in, in me. You're awakening in me. It's like when the scriptures say, let God arise. Well, God can't arise. He's already higher than the highest. He's called El Elyon. He's called the highest. But he can arise in our hearts, right? So what we want to do tonight is stand more in all of him and continue to awaken that awestruck sense we have when we're really in his presence. So if you have your Bibles, can you open them to Psalm chapter 2? Psalm chapter 2 is where we're going to be. And as you're turning to Psalm chapter 2, I will just tell you right now a rude awakening that I had one day when I was in my basement in what we call the mud room. And most of you know I grew up in Philadelphia, uh, not far from where Bob grew up. And my dad was in the military, and so he had a duffel bag that he just jam-packed deep with newspapers. And he chained it to the ceiling, and he put it in the wall of the mud room so that it didn't swing around. And we would just you know, work out on that bag, my brother and I growing up. So I'm around 15 years old and I'm jabbing that bag and I'm working on my combinations. Now for, uh, my father was a fireman in Philadelphia for over 30 years, but somewhere around 15 years old, I'm, I'm sweating, Rocky's my inspiration, it's 1985 and my dad comes in from work, you know, smelling like fire, he's got the uniform on and I had the gloves on and I'm banging that bag and I am feeling so ready. So he comes through the mud room. Like in our house, you don't come through the front door. Does anyone have a house like this? Like if, you, like if anyone knocks on our front door, like you know they don't know us. Because if you know us, we're from Philly. You come down through the basement. That's how you come into that house, right? Does anyone else have a house like that? So my dad comes through the door, comes into the mud room, and I have two gloves on, and I look at him, and I take two that are on a file cabinet, and I just knock them onto the floor, like pick them up. I'm ready. Let's go, right? And so my dad bends over and he puts one on, he puts the other on and he starts to smile. And he, he goes, <laughs> okay. And then I'm like, I'm all serious, like I'm all in. And my dad goes, <laughs> bam, hits me right in the face. And he starts laughing again. He's like, bam, bam, right in the, bam, jab, jab. And in 45 seconds, I literally was almost knocked out. And then as he chuckles, he took them off and he put them right back where they were on the floor and went into the house for dinner, right? And I'm just like, remember the cartoon where the stars are going and the Tweety Birds are singing? Like, that's how I'm feeling at this moment. And it was an awakening. And there's an awakening that happens right here in Psalm chapter 2. If you're not familiar with it, Psalm chapter 2 is what they call a messianic psalm. That means that it has multiple meanings. Just like right now back in Ocean City, we're in the book of Revelation. And Revelation is a book about what has happened, what is happening, and what shall quickly come to pass. <laughs> These psalms, did I just snort like a pig? Did anyone hear that? <laughs> I've been so rested for the past five days that I could fall asleep right now. I just snored in the middle of a message of a couple hundred people. So in the message, what happens is, is you're going to see it has implications of David's day. It has implications for these present days, and it has a future implication. These verses are surrounding the people that were actually living in David's day and were contending with the throne of Israel. They were fighting with David about the throne of David. And we know that God gave a promise to David that his king, his lineage, his legacy would sit on that throne forevermore. We know that every son of David that ever sat on that throne is but a mere shadow of the true son of David known as Mashiach in the Hebrew, known as the Messiah of the Jews. He's known as the anointed one of Israel. He's known as the Christ of the nations. He's known as the savior of the world. In this chapter, he's called the anointed. He's called the son. He's called the king. He's called the heir of nations. He's called the possessor of the earth. And he is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you believe in him, say amen. So we're going to see in these verses that it's written by David, but it's also referencing any attack on this throne, on Christ and his kingdom. Now, this mutiny by the nations first comes to critical mass. It first comes to terminal velocity at the foot of Calvary. But we also know that the rebellion against God's kingdom continued throughout history. 
philosophers tried to crush its credibility. Celebrities have tried to silence the message of this kingdom. The Bolsheviks and the bourgeoisie both tried to banish the book of this kingdom. There are nations and governments and cultures and societies that have resisted the claims of the gospel, the call of Christ, and the reality of his coming kingdom. So come with me and let's watch and look and see. Psalm chapter two, verse one says this, why do the heathen rage and the heathen are the lost nations of the world? And why do the people imagine a vain thing? Now apparently David asks here a rhetorical question. In other words, there's really no reply to verse one. It's simply a statement of astonishment. It's a statement of bewilderment. This is what David would say in modern day. After all that God has done to reveal his wisdom and his power and his love and his compassion to the nations, they still meaninglessly meditate and murmur musing on the global mutiny against God. And God has proclaimed his power. God has provided for their basic needs. God has guided them to safety. Today we even see that he sent his own son to be the savior, bringing forgiveness and salvation and eternal life. Yet, the psalmist and many other writers of the scriptures record humanity's frivolous, foolish, futile attempts of rebellion against the very one that creates the body, sustains the life of everything that has breath. Look at verse two. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's the word, Mashiach, the Messiah, the, the chosen, the Christ. And here's what they say. Let us break the bands asunder. Let us cast away their cords from us. And being on a boat for five days, you get a real strong sense of the metaphor of what it means to cast away the cords and to have your own freedom. Now, notice the nation's rebellion and rejection is not the same as just casual, careless indifference towards spiritual things, no. These are the words of waging war against the Lord and against his anointed, his Messiah, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. Although nation today may strive against nation, in the East, there's a proverb that says this, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Have you ever heard that expression before? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. I've seen it happen even when I was a teacher in junior high where two kids, their fellowship existed not because they really liked each other, but they both didn't like this kid over here. And they struck up a friendship over here and their commonality was that they didn't like this person over here. And the scriptures say the same things are going to happen against the nation of Israel. Nations will unite against them, and nations will unite against God. Because he will be the common enemy, and that will be their common mission. Now, in the New Testament, we see frequent references to this psalm, Psalm 2, and how it correlates to Christ. I don't have time tonight, Matthew chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 5, refer to Christ being the Son, being the Anointed One, specifically those chapters referencing this psalm, Psalm 2. In this prophetic messianic psalm, the mantra is basically this, we don't want the Lord, or his chosen to be our king. Let's continue in verse four. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Derision, la'ag is the word in the Hebrew. It means to mock. Like God's gonna be like my dad in the mudroom. Like, are you kidding me? Okay. You have to be joking, right? That's how it says is going to be his response from heaven. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them, Baha'al, means that they tremble in his sore displeasure. In a metaphoric, poetic way, the psalmist is describing God as laughing at the very thought of an attack on his son. You'd see it again in Psalm 37, 13, the same expression. 
The idea of fighting off, please listen, the idea of fighting off the will of God is at best ridiculous. And maybe someone in this room needs to hear that tonight because you're fighting off the will of God and you know it. May God bring it to the surface of your conscience, whatever it is, so you deal with it. The idea of fighting off the will of God is at best ridiculous. What are the kings of the earth compared to the king of kings? What are the kings of countries compared to the king of the cosmos? Verse six, yet, this is a word of contrast, yet, however, but nevertheless, I, watch how the syntax changes to the first person, I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. The father, did you see this now in the psalm? The father now begins to speak from heaven. My holy hill refers to Jerusalem. Zion is another name for Jerusalem. The reason it was holy is because that's the place where Abraham took Isaac it was the place where the temple was or will be built. It's where the Savior Jesus would lay down his life just as God proclaims his anointed son will sit upon the throne in Jerusalem. God is still speaking in his grace on a global leather, level, le level, gathering his people, calling them to trust in his son. God's giving you the plan all the way back here in Psalm 2. And as peaceful and as joyful and as wonderful and as faithful and grateful and hopeful and as we sung, as beautiful as that good news is of the gospel, we can't overlook the fact that there will come a day where God's warmth will turn into God's wrath. That's just a fact. And I love you enough to tell you. Bless you. I'm glad you laugh uh, because um, some of you visit in the summer and you say that you really enjoy the messages and, and Matt, Matt Stokes, he's really funny, but like um, sometimes I'm not. Sometimes there's nothing funny about it. And I'm coming here tonight to see you and there's a part of me, like the natural me, that would want to like entertain you and make you laugh and say, oh, that speaker, and that was really entertaining, and he was funny. There's nothing funny about this message. It's like a really serious message. But it's what God pressed into my heart to, to bring to you tonight, that someday God's warmth is going to turn into God's wrath. We'll see it in the book of Revelation the releasing of God's judgment upon the people in a Christ-rejecting nation of the world. Nation after nation after nation. A quick cross-referencing of Scripture makes it clear if people refuse to embrace and receive God's provision for the sins of every person from every nation without any distinction, if people refuse to embrace and receive God's judgment of sin on the cross, the substitutionary sacrifice of his son, if people refuse to embrace and trust the work of Christ, dying on the cross for my sins and in my place and rising from the grave three days later to show that it was all true, they're accepting God's judgment upon themselves and they will pay the price for their own sins. That is what I would call meaningless mutiny. Jesus said in Matthew, if you don't believe, and what he meant was if you don't believe that I'm the one, if you don't believe that I'm the Messiah, if you don't believe that I'm the Savior, you will die in your sins. John chapter 8, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. They knew what he meant when he said that. Because the ancient prophets said, behold, those who are in darkness, that's the nations of the world that live in darkness, shall see a great light. Now you have Jesus on the scene and he says, I'm the light. I'm the light of the world. And if you don't believe in me, you will die in your sins. Take that and integrate it with Romans chapter 3 where it says the wages of sin is death. 
And the book of Revelation tells us this death is more than a loss of life. It's called the second death. It's eternal isolation. It's infinite separation. It's forever lamentation. Read Revelation chapter 20. The word lamentation, what does that mean? It means to cry out until there's no strength left. Have you ever cried out so hard to the degree that you literally didn't have any strength left? Picture being in that state for eternity. Jesus said in hell, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm not gonna stay here forever, but just listen to this, please. A quick consideration of that context tells us two things. One, if there's weeping, that means there's gonna be emotional pain. And number two, if there's gnashing of teeth, that means there's gonna be a physical pain. Jesus also said there's gonna be weeping and gnashing of teeth where the fire is not quenched and their worm, their worm, their worm dieth not. What does that even mean? Does each person in hell get their own personal worm? I mean, I don't know what that means. I don't even wanna know what that means. Does not sound pleasant or encouraging that you have your own night crawler of discouragement to keep you company in hell. So let's just move on knowing that there's a real judgment and punishment for a Christ-rejecting, Christ-rebelling world. Verse seven, David says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen, that's the rebellious lost world. I will give you the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. The reason, first of all, if you know the context of this, that didn't happen to David. God never gave him the heathen as an inheritance, and God never gave him the possession of the earth. The reason it says rod of iron is because the future role of this royal son will be absolute. There will be no rebellion. The lost, rebelling, rejecting world has as much chance as having victory over Christ as my orange terracotta planter pot when I have my crowbar back in full swing. Do you get the picture? Do you see the metaphor? The son that is now seated on the throne declares what the father has said to him. Verse seven, the king proclaims the Lord's decree. The short phrase tells us that God rules over his creation and God rules over every rebel on the basis of his sovereign decrees. Uh, huh, what? In other words, let me just put it in a short phrase for you, God's decisions are not up for debate. God's decisions, God's determinations are not up for debate. They're not up for discussion. They're not up for your opinion. And when we get to that place where we fall into, as John said, complete submission and surrender, we go to a whole nother level. And I want to encourage you to find that place tonight as we all seek for it and search for it and ask for it. This isn't about a consensus. This isn't about congregational rule. This is about God's decree, and God's decrees are righteous, and God's decrees are just, and God's decrees are true. He never makes a mistake. In these verses, the Father has promised the Son complete, undeniable victory over the nation's rejections. Scripture makes it clear that one day the Son will rule, one day the Son will reign over all kings and all kingdoms of the world. Where are you in the midst of that? Do you give an intellectual acknowledgement to the truth of that scripture? Or are you passionately fighting to follow him, support him, proclaim him? Get into the battle. Wage war against hell. Verse 8 reminds us how Satan offered up the son this kingship without cost. Do you remember that? when he had Christ in the desert, destitute of food for 40 days, if he would just give Satan some props, some acknowledgement, how powerful he is, knowledgeable, strategic, influential, but Jesus refused. Christ didn't comply. 
Christ didn't compromise. That's why we can be confident that Christ's rule will be faithful to who he is. And this is the point of what I'm just trying to share with you tonight. Please listen. Being faithful to who he is includes being firm and severe when dealing with sin. If the nations oppose him, the gospels show us that Christ will cry with compassion. But the Psalms and Revelation show us that in his justice he will laugh in their derision. At the futility of their attempts, he will smash them like a potter's useless vessel. So I'm gonna ask you again, where are you in relation to Christ today? Tonight, in the midst of this moment? Are you in verse nine, feeling like he rules over you with a rod of iron? Are you feeling like your destiny is to be dashed into pieces like a clay pot? If you're here tonight and you're listening, please be encouraged. In Corinthians, it says that we are clay pots. We are simple, fragile, typical clay pots. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. But what but what makes us great and what makes us mighty and what makes us strong and what makes us special and unique in God's kingdom is what God places inside these clay pots. God says there's gold in these pots. Who puts, who puts a treasure of any value into a clay pot? God does. And it's greater than any gold greater than any riches or treasure in the chest of a thousand kings. The treasure, here's the treasure. The treasure is called the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Listen to it again. The treasure is called, the treasure is called the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what we carry within us. And you can bank all the bullion in the world and you will never come close to the value. You'll never come close to the glory of what God in his grace has given you in the knowledge of his son. I mean, what would you do if to the core of your being you really believe that? Like in the depths of your soul you really believed that there was a treasure within this earthen vessel, within this clay pot called the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I mean, would that really, would that change the way you live? Would that change the way that you love your enemies? Would that change the way you raise your children? Would that change the way that you love your spouse? Verse 10, quickly. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. It says rejoice with trembling because, why? Because It's only within the proper integration of fear and adoration and reverence and awe of the most high and holy God that there can be genuine joy in the kingdom of God. Fear because you know that it's your breath in your lungs that he's given you this day. Adoration because you know that he loves you and he shows you on the cross. Reverence because he's holy and all because he never was not and he always will be. That's your God. Last verse, and we'll close. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way. But when his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Kiss the son. In this passage, the kings and all the people were challenged to see the reasonableness of coming to make the right choice. They could either love and respect the Lord's anointed, or they could experience the great blessing, or they could choose to refuse and receive wrath. The last three verses are a summation of this whole psalm. Verse 10 is be wise and be warned. Verse 11 is serve and rejoice. And then you have verse 12 here. Humbly submit, humbly surrender to his love. I mean, who wouldn't want that? 
who wouldn't want this gift? In view of all that's being declared and decreed, the nations condemned, the sun enthroned, the wise thing for those who, within the hearing of the psalm, is to do, is to surrender to Christ and trust him today. The scriptures say, Titus chapter 2, 1 Timothy 4, that the Spirit, the Spirit speaks directly into the hearts of men and women and makes a plea for the sinner to turn to the Savior. Once the Spirit has instructed the mind, he then pleads and appeals to the person's will, calling the wayward to start serving the Lord and stop serving sin. That's verse 11. Any child growing up in somewhat of a healthy setting knows what it's like, like my dad, right? Like, I love my dad, but I feared my dad, right? And it was healthy. It was a good thing, right? And my children are the same. So I, when our youngest, Sydney, was little, I would call her, Sydney, come here! And she'd come running downstairs, and when Laura would call her, she wouldn't come. And Laura said, why don't you come when I call you? You only come when dad calls you. Sydney was like three going on four. And she said, because he has a deeper voice. (laughs) That's literally what she said, right? Like there's a love there, but there's a fear there. And it's a healthy fear. And what I'm explaining to you is a cute little story, but an infinitesimal shadow of what we ought to be experiencing with our Father in heaven. 1 John 4 tells us that our love for the Lord will cast out all fear, all sinful fear. And we're told throughout the scriptures that our pursuit of knowing God is directly related to our understanding of what it means to fear God. You can't really have a biblical experience of fearing God unless you know God. In other words, to stand in all of his omnipotence, to stand in all of his sovereign power, to stand in all of his infinite wisdom, to stand in all of his divine presence, and we fear. We love our heavenly father. The scriptures say that we've been given a spirit by which we can call him Abba, which is beautiful. In Romans chapter 8, we've been given a spirit within us. When we're birthed into Christ and we, we give our lives to him, we're given a spirit within us that's able to call him Abba. Abba is a, is a, is a Hebrew word. It's a very familiar, infin, um, intimate, but also a very respectful word for father, for dad. But that being said, let me close by saying this. Never lose our respect for his authority and for his sovereignty. His last words in this psalm are an appeal to the hearts of men and women, to the listeners. There's a call to see his love and his provision and respond with submission and devotion. So as we close this portion of the evening, how will you respond to the King of Kings? How will you respond to the Lord of Lords? May you serve the Lord with fear And may you rejoice with trembling, saying you're the ruler of the nations. You're the all-seeing. You're the all-knowing. You're the ever-present. You're the anointed one. You're the maker of heaven. You're the maker of earth. You're the one with one word you can move the mountains. With one word you can calm the raging seas. With one word you can create. You can deliver. You can redeem. You're the way. You're the truth. You're the life. You're the light. You're the lamb of God. You're the lover of my soul. You're the prince of peace. You're the mighty God. You're the good shepherd. You're the great high priest. That's what you are. You're God, and I will worship you. And that's how we go to a whole nother level. Let's pray. Father, as our hearts are before you now, your word speaks expressly to us. We pray that if there's anyone here this evening that wants to give their life to you, submit themselves to you, go public with their faith in you, that now would be the time, that this would be the place where we watch you work. You're the king of kings, creator of the universe. And through the cross and your resurrection, you show that you are the lover of sinful souls. 
like mine and everyone in this room and every person in the world. Give us the eyes to see, the wisdom, the revelation, the insight to know your greatness, your goodness, your justice, and your love. Amen.